Meredith Arthur. Most people call me Mary. I'm a dietitian, but I'm probably not your dietitian. So please talk with your own personal healthcare provider about anything said in this video. Don't make changes to your diet, your supplements, your medications, or your lifestyle without having a practitioner review these things and consider if this is happening in your life. And I say this because Jenny Jones, PhD, and I, we came up with a collaborative hypothesis called the MOCO steel that leads to a sulfite trap. So this is part one. It's the summary of the MOCO steel that leads to a sulfite trap. And this is probably going to be a video series, but I will link to my um, thesis paper that I wrote and Jenny helped to make sure that I was doing a good job because she is my oracle and I am Batman. That's what my husband says. We work as a team. So um, I'll link to it and you can read through it so you won't have to be in suspense. But I can't make all the videos at once because I am actually stuck in the sulfite trap right now. So experience makes experts. And the only reason I don't have my video on is because I don't have a video recorder that has a video camera, I guess. And I don't know how to find that. So anyway, <laughs> it's not because I look really horrible. No rumors, please. Okay. I am tired though. You would see the bags under my eyes because part of this pathway is that you start to get insomnia. You don't require sleep, it seems. Your brain is just going. So that's when I do all my research for the nine hours in the middle of the night. <laughs> Okay, so this is a slide about the molybdenum cofactor. So in our bodies, we use molybdenum, um, but we really only use it for five enzymes. Now, to not get confused, this nitrate reductase enzyme is not one of the enzymes in our body. It's only found in plants and bacteria. The five enzymes, though, are actually xanthine oxidase, and xanthine dehydrogenase. So this enzyme is really interesting because it comes from xanthine oxidoreductase. And depending on if you have thiols, like H2S or no H2S, it will change what type of enzyme it is. And I'll do a future presentation on that. If you don't have available hydrogen sulfide or H2S or thiol, you know, a general thiol, then it, your body will irreversibly convert it into xanthine dehydrogenase. I'm sorry. Wait, is that right? Uh, yeah, I know. It'll re irreversibly convert it into xanthine oxidase. Okay, so xanthine oxidase and xanthine dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase they both make uric acid. Um, but really, you want to not have too much xanthine oxidase. So how you get that, how you get xanthine dehydrogenase to become xanthine oxidase is with a thiol group. So xanthine dehydrogenase recycles NAD to NADH, but xanthine oxidase makes superoxide. Okay. And then, so that's one, two enzymes. The third enzyme is aldehyde oxidase, and it metabolizes retinal aldehyde, niacin, and its derivatives vitamin B6, the drug zonisamide. There are a few other drugs. There's a whole article about the drugs that aldehyde oxidase metabolizes, caffeine, and also nitrates. And this enzyme also makes superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Well, the superoxide becomes hydrogen peroxide, okay? And so all of the enzymes on the left side of this chart they actually require molybdenum cofactor. Up here at the top is molybdenum cofactor. And to be able to use molybdenum cofactor in the Zor family of enzymes that are on the left, you have to remove um, um, a cysteine group with moco sulfurase. So you see that this molybdenum cofactor over here has a cysteine added to it, and this one does not. So moco sulfurase removes that. Okay, so you can make the Azor family of enzymes or you make the enzymes in the sulfite oxidase family. So there's this mitochondrial amidoxine reducing component, and there's not a lot of, of studies. Well, there are studies of this, but the understanding of it is um, 
like a bit complex. So, and I mean, I, it does make a difference, right? I'm not saying it doesn't, but I haven't studied this completely. So if any of you are experts in MR, please feel free to join in. <laughs> so, um, and then there's sulfite oxidase. And sulfite oxidase, it requires a heme group. So that means you have to make heme if you want to make the enzyme sulfide oxidase. And if you read through the hypothesis paper, you can see that I think that people end up struggling with heme metabolism because of sulfite toxicity, because of sulfite toxicity's downstream effects on multiple cofactors. It can affect your potassium. I'm sorry, not your potassium. It can affect your potassium levels. I'll talk about that too. But um, it can affect your ability to... Um, have active B6. Well, to start making heme, you require B6. It actually, sulfite in the form of the toxin we're going to talk about next as sulfocysteine, it actually can contribute to zinc being pushed to the outside of the cell so that there's no intracellular zinc. It's just in this compartment waiting to help out. And so if that happens, you don't have zinc to complete the heme pathway. And so Talking about heme will be a different presentation. There's lots of practitioners out there who know about heme. So I think that you can easily just look up a video <laughs> to learn about that. Um, okay, so Jenny's original theory that caught my attention and she told it to me um, because, you know, Zoe, my daughter, she has a rare genetic syndrome called MBD5 deletion. And MBD5 alters 448 genes either up or down. So it changes the mRNA level of these genes. And Jenny and I had been discussing the seizure disorder and things that could be contributing to it. And that sulfite actually can cause the functional B6 deficiency that could lead to really high levels of glutamate and low levels of GABA. And that was concerning to me. We actually came up with a hypothesis on that, which is really great. It's called, um, it's a moonlighting enzyme, ALDH7A1 moonlights. And so you can actually end up with a functional B6 deficiency. My theory was that it's moonlighting around the cell, which is still possible. And then Jenny found that sulfite inhibits it completely. So you can go watch that video on ALDH7A1 and functional B6 deficiency. But Jenny had thought that perhaps sulfite was contributing by causing a functional B6 deficiency, which would result in a seizure disorder, sort of like pyridoxal dependent epilepsy. So I became concerned though, because Zoe's genetic syndrome usually results in seizure disorder. And right now she just has diffuse cerebral dysfunction with epileptic discharges, but not full on seizures. So we've chose not to treat her for that. Um, because sometimes treatment is worse than just, you know, monitoring. And so I wanted to prevent Zoe from having seizures. And so it was important to me to explore the sulfite issue and molybdenum cofactor. And I feel like Zoe set up for failure because her, her, um, MB, M, her MBD5 deletion actually makes her make more mucosulfurase. And so she prefers to make more Zor family of enzymes and less sulfite oxidase family. So she's set up for failure, basically. However, I now think that Zoe doesn't make molybdenum cofactor. She does have high uric acid levels occasionally. Um, it goes up and down, and I actually think that's bacteria in her gut producing uric acid in attempts to save her. I, I honestly think that she is stuck now in a sulfite trap and it would explain her autism symptoms. It, will exp it explains our kids with autism. So let's talk about that. Okay, so this is adapted from Gefrin Central GABAergic Synapse Organizer from the Experimental and Molecular Medicine it's like volume four, 47. I actually added in here, I added the, the this compound, sorry, this compound right here. And I guess it's not a compound, it's a molecule. I don't know. Y'all, my brain, <laughs> I'm stuck in this pathway. Okay, so, 
So I added S-sulfocysteine and I added this NMDA receptor and I added in the calcium and this particular thing, calpane. So over here, um, we have the presynaptic membrane and then we have the postsynaptic membrane. And so the goal is to pass this GABA along, okay? And so the, um, when, at, ga so GABA is our calming um, neurotransmitter, okay? So glutamate is the excitatory one and GABA is the calming one. And so whenever a nerve fires, there's supposed to be a transfer of GABA across the synapse to calm the nerve down. And so you can see that there's these GABA receptors along here. And what's holding the GABA receptors in place is a thing called Geffrin. Okay, it's like this little lacy thing holding everything in place. And then next to the geff Geffrin is an actin filament. So the Geffrin is bound to the actin filament and has these little proteins here that go with it. Um, and the actin filament is bound here. And if you have watched my anhydroretinol videos, then we know that anhydroretinol, if someone is a maker of that, it can actually destroy effectin. And then that would mean that there's nothing for Geffrin to hold on to. Okay, so the, p the possibility that anhydroretinol is getting into the nervous system, I think it's pretty slim. You would have to be an alcoholic drinking a lot of alcohol and all you're doing is circulating anhydroretinol. So that alone didn't explain to me why my daughter would have symptoms of almost full seizures. And I'm blessed that she doesn't have full seizures. I have a lot of hypotheses as to why that is, but I won't go over them here. So what is happening though, is when you get sulfite toxicity, your body can deal with it by combining it with, a, with cysteine and it becomes S-sulfocysteine. Okay, so F-sulfocysteine is like glutamate on steroids. And so it, um, it triggers the NMDAR receptor and it causes a huge influx of calcium into the neuron. And, and then that calcium activates something called calpane protease. Calpane protease destroys gephrin. And in sulfite oxidase deficiency, this is what they see. They see that the GABA synapses are lost. And so then they have seizures because if you do not have a normal GABA synapse, then you can't have an inhibitory effect on your seizures. And then also you would have like a glutamate type reaction and it's not glutamate. Although these kids are sensitive to glutamate, anything that you add and Jenny felt like this too, that a low glutamate diet helped her to avoid a seizure because in the background, she was having S-sulfocysteine overstimulating her NMDAR, okay? So like my daughter will suddenly just be very irritated and angry and scream or like hit her head or, you know, if her head's hurting, she would hit it. I mean, she's not like a head banger, but some of the kids in our group have progressed to that where they'll hit their heads hard. And I think it's because their heads are hurting. They could also be struggling with hyperchloremia. And I'll make a future video about that. But this S-sulfocysteine in the kidneys, when it interacts with NMDAR in the kidneys, it causes loss of potassium and it causes loss of sodium. It causes the inability to reuptake bicarbonate. So you go into acidosis and then it causes hyperchloremia. And the hyperchloremia gives you a pounding headache. I can attest to that because I've had it. <laughs> and it's like, it can cause intracranial hypertension. And the headache, it's just horrible. When you lay down, it hurts. When you're standing up, it hurts. And so these kids are mutilating themselves because the pressure in their brain is so high and the headache is so bad. And the pounding heart feels like anxiety and the mind going nonstop, can't sleep. All of these things are happening because of sulfite toxicity, because they can't make sulfite, either they can't make the SUOX enzyme because heme is broken, or they can't make molybdenum cofactor. So I actually had my, the final person that I talked to, she's wonderful and, she, and um, 
she kept so many good logs of what was happening to her in her organic acid test. Um, but a couple of people have come to me and said, like, I take molybdenum. Every time I do, I get symptoms of copper deficiency. And I was like, weird. And they're like, yeah, like, I can't, I can't take it. So that confused me because the standard protocol, when you think you have a sulfur metabolism issue, is you take a lot of molybdenum because you're trying to basically, I think, I think the reason you take more would be you're trying to get past the hydrogen, I'm sorry, the sulfur metabolizing bacteria in your small bowel if you have SIBO, because they'll actually make it so the molybdenum is not available to make molybdenum cofactor. But if you're doing that and you can't out, like say you're taking 800 milligrams a day, which I would never recommend, by the way. Um, I mean, I've never recommended it before. <laughs> so, um, But if you were taking that much a day and you still weren't making molybdenum cofactor and you were just ending up with copper deficiency, then what is going on? That doesn't make sense, right? So I decided to think about what would happen we have NMDA receptors through our entire body. We used to think it was just in the nervous system, but it's in our entire body. Lots of cells have these. So what would happen if this esophocysteine overstimulated MNDAR, let's say in an intestinal cell, okay? Or any cell in the body. So that's this slide. <laughs> it looks really complicated. I really want to make a simpler version. But I'm going to use this one. Okay, so here's where we will start. In the blood, our, so the sulfite that eventually, um, the sulfite is down here, okay? So usually, so what's, what's going on? And you'll, if you read the thesis statement, I believe that what is happening now is that there is an interplay between the transsulfuration pathway and the immune system or the hypoxia pathway. So there's a pathway called the hypoxia inducible factor one alpha pathway. So any times that we're, that we're fighting fungus or a bacterial infection, um, if we have hypoxia, which sulfide itself can cause hypoxia, you can see that over here. Um, if it provides a lot of reactive oxygen species, these there's actually um, to make these, this, these sulfite radicals, you use up oxygen in the mitochondria. And so then that causes hypoxia. So that will induce the hypoxia inducible factor one alpha pathway. And anytime that pathway is turned on, the body upregulates the production of CDO, cysteine dioxygenase. And the reason why is because your body wants to make cysteine sulfinic acid because it saves cells. It shuts them down. It turns off enzymes. It lodges itself in enzymes such as pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to keep it turned off. The reason why you would want to keep it turned off is because it protects it. So you don't have to remake the enzyme again. So it basically coats it, prevents it from having oxidative damage. That way, whenever the oxidative stress is gone, the entire cell will actually restart. And what actually increases the, the enzymes needed for oxidative stress? Well, that's NRF2. And it's not shown here, but many people know about NRF2. Um, and to activate NRF2, you have, you have to remember this. This is very important. You have to have cysteine to activate NRF2 so you can turn on your antioxidant enzymes. And so you can get rid of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. And once that's all cleaned up, then the cystinic, cyst, sorry, cysteine sulfinic acid will be removed from the enzymes and everything will continue forward. But what we have going on in this acquired type of sulfide oxidase deficiency is that it becomes a cysteine deficient state and the cell cannot turn on NERF2. And so you end up not being able to get rid of the oxidative stress that keeps the cells shut down and it provides like it's total chronic fatigue, but not just regular chronic fatigue, like wired and tired chronic fatigue so that you're exhausted, but you wake up with a racing heart after a few hours of sleep and then you can't go back to sleep 
and you don't get well rested. It's um, like, I should have known I had this when I was younger, but um, I was once told that I have non-restorative sleep disorder, that my heart races while I'm sleeping. Well, that would be a sign of having sulfite oxidase um, deficiency, I think. Okay. Okay, so let's say that your sulfite oxidase enzyme is not working, okay, for any particular reason. Um, let's just say for this reason that you actually um, haven't made um, heme or moco. I mean, it could be that you're just not making moco, but let's just go full on crazy. <laughs> let's say there's no, there's no heme to be able to make sulfite oxidase. So the sulfite actually will be eventually excreted into the blood, and then it will bind with cysteine, and it will make S-sulfacysteine, okay? And then S-sulfacysteine will interact with the NMDA receptor and it will cause an excessive amount of calcium to enter into the cell. Um, so then that activates, just like in the nerve cell, it, I think it activates calpane protease. Biology is redundant, right? So cells are cells. They Some cells express some things, but... Um, all cells that have to make sulfite oxidase will expect, ex express gephrin. And so NMDA being overactivated by S-sulfacysteine leads to activation of calpane protease, which breaks down gephrin. And then the gephrin is not available. And what gephrin does in a cell other than the nervous system is it is actually the means by which molybdenum is put in the molybdenum cofactor. So it comes into the cell, interacts with gephrin, and then gephrin helps to load the MPT, the molybdoctrin, with molybdenum, and that makes moco. Okay, so as soon as the calcium levels go up in the cell, we have destruction of gephrin. So let's talk a little bit more about how you make MOCO. So it starts with GTP. And GTP is something that if you were to stop the purine pathway, you could actually increase your GTP levels. So um, using like a xanthine oxidase inhibitor can help with that. But I honestly think that most people's uric acid is coming from their gut microbiome. Um, so I'm unsure about using xanthine oxidase inhibitors. It was something I thought about when I originally was doing this thesis statement. And now I'm kind of weary of it because I think that we're not, um, I think we're going to only inhibit the bacteria making the uric acid. I think that we ourselves are struggling with some of the things and that's why we're growing these bacteria so that they can help us out in life. Um, so you start with GTP and then there's some genetic enzymes that <laughs> the sulfite oxidase papers say that it's pretty, you know, it's going to be rare to have these, but you can always check your genetics. Um, and then you have to have MPT, molybdoptrin. This is not molybdenum. This is the step right before you add molybdenum. So molybdoptrin is made with cysteine. And what I think what I think is happening is people are becoming cysteine deficient from staying in this pathway too long. And so then they cannot even make MPT. And that's bad because you cannot... You cannot convert FMN to FAD without MPT. It's a cofactor for FAD synthase. Okay, and that's listed here up at the top. Um, so FMN requires magnesium for its cofactor like to be made. Um, the, the, that enzyme requires magnesium. When cells are super high in calcium, there's not much magnesium in the cell. And so magnesium deficiency prevents B2 from being converted into FMN, and then the lack of MPT because of the cysteine deficiency prevents the ability to make FAD. You can take all the B2 you want, but if you can't make MPT because you're cysteine deficient or because you're struggling with GTP or GTP recycling, which can happen, for example, when people switch to a carnivore diet, which tends to be therapeutic for some of the, the nasty feelings you get when you get sulfide oxidase deficiency, um, they'll end up being stuck in gluconeogenesis and then they'll struggle with having enough GTP because um, 
the enzyme phospho, it's like P-E-P-C-K. I can't remember the name right now. Forgive me. It's in my paper. But um, it requires it requires GTP as a cofactor. So GTP is converted to GTP. Okay. So now we have a problem, right? Because we don't even have MPT. So um, that comes into play later when we start to try to restart metabolism. But now let's talk about what else calcium can do to a cell to really cause calpine to be activated and also to pretty much destroy metabolism. So the calcium is in the cell, but at, and um, it's activating cal calcium protease, but it also inhibits large amounts of calcium. Calcium will inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And so that leads to a buildup of pyruvate and high pyruvate levels activate hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. And what that does in a cell is it increases the cysteine dioxygenase activity. So more cysteine is converted to cysteine sulfinic acid to shut down metabolism, but whatever is left over is converted into sulfite. And then that sulfite damages the mitochondria and causes hypoxia. And that triggers the hypoxia-inducible factor one alpha pathway. And that makes CDO increase. And so you can see this is a very big vicious cycle. So the pyruvate will actually be converted to lactate. And so people who are struggling with lactic acidosis on their organic acid test, um, I mean, that could be a classic vitamin deficiency. It could be any one of these cofactors that's deficient, or it could be S-sulfocysteine causing hypercalcemia. I'm sorry, not hypercalcemia. It high intracellular calcium, and that's inhibiting pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So which one is it? That's what we want to know about our clients, or I want to know about my clients when I see them. <laughs> By the way, I'm kind of putting that on hold because I need to recover from this pathway. So, um, so the lactate actually combines with the calcium and it makes calcium lactate. And this doesn't stop at all because you constantly have this production of sulfite. The sulfite will leave the cell to join like the redox system in the blood. It'll make more as sulfacysteine. And then also because you're in acidosis from this pathway, you don't really uptake too much cysteine into the cell because this XC tram transporter doesn't work well in acidosis. And so you just constantly get more input on NMDA. And then the ability to convert um, Oh, this, this is in the wrong spot. Oops. Um, lactate dehydrogenase is supposed to be over here. <laughs> so y'all forgive me. I'll fix it in my diagram and put it in my thesis and update it. But this LDH enzyme is right here between lactate and pyruvate, not right here between calcium and lactate. That was a bad mistake. Um, so the lactate, um, the pyruvate to lactate, um, it actually won't be turned off because the HIF-1 alpha pathway actually increases lactate dehydrogenase. It, it wants that enzyme to be high. Um, it does that as part of the immune function because white blood cells require more glucose. Um, that's part of it. So there's a lot involved in that. Okay, so the calcium lactate can actually also activate calcium protease. They actually see this in pulmonary... Um, hypertension or fibrosis, one of those. I think it's pulmonary hypertension is what I read. And so they know that this can can actually activate calpain protease. So we basically are kind of stuck, right? And so one of the things that I was looking at, and I actually had to do for myself, so, um, and this is not medical advice, but I developed high blood pressure from this, like stroke level high blood pressure, like 180 over 110. And not a single blood pressure medicine helped me. They all like worsened my symptoms or made me have like problems with, you know, low sodium. So, um, what I found though was when I took Benadryl, my blood pressure went down to normal and my heart start stopped thumping hard. And I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't overcome my entire sleep problem because I still only sleep about five hours where I used to sleep nine my whole life. But, um, I went from only being able to sleep for two or three hours to be able to sleep for five. And I think that's going to continue to get better. Um, 
So what Benadryl does is it blocks this NMDA receptor in a dose-dependent manner. And so you can titrate it depending on how you feel. And fortunately for me, part of my symptoms is overall body burning. (laughs) So whenever I have overall body burning, I know for sure that I have this S-sulfocysteine overstimulating the, the glutamate receptor, the NMDA receptor, And because I don't have enough GABA synapses to turn it off because they've all been degraded because of the loss of Geffrin, I experience extreme pain, um, very bad pain. So what about when you turn it off? Well, here's the problem that I found. Um, Before I found the Benadryl thing because I was in the emergency room, Um, actually it's a funny story. So when we were in the emergency room, I, um, you know, I was, they gave me chloride containing IV fluids, even though I asked them not to, because I had a suspicion I was stuck in this pathway and I had a psychotic break from it. It was the worst thing I've ever experienced. I thought the whole hospital was out to get me and I'm not that kind of person. I worked in the hospital for like 15 years or so. And I wrote IV nutrition support for 10 years. I trust doctors who are in acute care because they're to, they're to save lives. But I was paranoid and my husband had to talk me down from it. And then I got the worst headache ever from the chloride. So they gave me a migraine cocktail and I refused Reglan because Reglan actually increases the NMDA receptors. I didn't need that. I already had plenty firing off. Um, they gave me Zofran. I didn't want the Zofran, but they said they had to because they know that whenever they give someone a migraine cocktail, they'll start to vomit and they won't be able to stop and they won't be able to discharge them. So they gave me Benadryl and Tordal and Benadryl and Tordal both block NMDA. So why are people vomiting? Well, If you block this S-sulfocysteine, then the calcium levels go down in the cell and pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is uninhibited and it can try to move forward. But if you're thiamine deficient, you'll basically just turn, um, you just won't be able to go forward and, um, and you'll get blocked right here. And I'm not sure if this is an uh, actually a good hypothesis. You can look at my paper that I have write a little bit about it, but um, I think that we get stuck right there. And the reason why is because lipoic acid, it needs a sulfur atom that comes from cysteine and the entire cell is depleted in cysteine. So you, I really don't think that people are getting past lipoic acid who are struggling in this pathway. And so for me, the symptom of that was that Every time, every time that I took thiamine to try to replete my thiamine, because I did know that I was thiamine deficient um, from sulfite toxicity, I was pretty sure because the week before I went to the emergency room, I couldn't tolerate any carbohydrates. I was, I was like nauseous every time I got above like 15 grams and I'd have to like wait three or four hours to be able to eat again. Um, so when I tried to take thiamine, it was only 25 milligrams, and I put it in a bunch of water, and I tried to sip it slow. I started to have convulsions. I was seizing, like, my body was seizing up so hard that I crunched down on a tooth that has a crown, and I can still feel the pain from it. So I'm going to have to go to the dentist for that one. But... um they thought that I was detoxing from drugs because the shakes were so bad. So they tested me for all the possible things that I could have taken. And I just, it didn't go away until they gave me the migraine cocktail. They wanted to give me thiamine, but I was like, no, I just had a bad reaction to thiamine. That's why I'm here. And actually when I took the thiamine, that's when I started to have swelling in my legs. So it went against every part of my dietitian being to refuse the thiamine, but I felt like my body was too fragile to go through that um, an IV infusion of 100 milligrams of thiamine. Ironically, if they had given me B12 shot, it would have mopped up some of the sulfite and I probably would have felt better for a little bit, except that I think that I have so much oxidative stress right now that I'll just drop the cobalt out of the B12 and then that'll start the hypoxia pathway too. So I don't, I don't honestly think B12 is the savior in this. I think that probably if we're relying on high dose B12 injections, we're probably just stuck with sulfite toxicity. Um, I'm kind of starting to think that any of these high dose protocols are actually treating sulfite toxicity, like copper combined to sulfite, iodine combined to sulfate, um, thiamine, you need it to outcompete the sulfite. And so 
what if the underlying problem is actually we're like Chris Master John says, maybe we're all bad at sulfur metabolism. Why would we all be bad at it? That's a really good question. Maybe it's because our total EMF exposure is off the chart now. Like I'm sitting next to my computer. I'm exposed to my Wi-Fi in my house. I wanted it wired, but they wired it wrong in our new house. Um, I live in the country so I can go outside, but a lot of us live in the city where we're exposed to all kinds of Wi-Fi. And that can increase the, you know, the influx of calcium through calcium channels. So perhaps we're all just stuck in this high intracellular calcium state and we've become makers of sulfite. Because sulfite will have a feed forward mechanism and either cause mitochondrial hypoxia if you don't have enough cysteine to bind it up. And I think that's why I get hangry. I have to eat right away because I have to get enough cysteine to bind up some of the sulfite because s sulfacysteine yeah, it overactivates the NMDAR, but it doesn't cause mitochondrial hypoxia. So I think we're just, a lot of us are stuck. And then we have the whole interplay of the immune system. And I think sometimes when we try to kill the gut bugs, I think that they grew there on purpose. And when we try to kill them, that causes a die-off. Like LPS will go into body, like leak in, right? Um, or it will be carried on chylomicrons. And LPS triggers the attacinate pathway, and the attacinate pathway leads to high sustenate, and then that leads to activation of the hypoxia-inducible factor one alpha pathway. And then that leads to the increase in CDO, and that eventually leads to sulfite. And so it's just this crazy feed-forward mechanism that we've gotten stuck in, and now we're treating it with all these high-dose supplements, when really we need to figure out how to come back to a resting state. And honestly, part of that is stress relief. <laughs> so that's why I'm putting this out there for everyone. If you think this is really happening, please come on board and help to solve this problem because I need to de-stress. So, okay. So now I want to talk a little, just a little bit more about what the cysteine deficiency does, because I think that the major block happening for um, for many people that I know is that S-sulfacysteine is blocking pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, but in the background, it's causing them not to be able to restart their metabolism because cysteine deficiency results in the loss of lipoic acid. Oh, that's spelled wrong. I'll fix it. Um, it needs a sulfur atom. FAD, because FAD synthase needs NPT. Um, it causes loss of coenzyme A, um, because coenzyme A is made with pantothenic acid and cysteine. And so if you're cysteine deficient, you can't make coenzyme A. Sulfite destroys thymine by cleavage of the methylene bridge. And then sulfite inhibits aldh 7 a one leading to loss of normal lysine metabolism. So that causes a buildup of P6C and it leads to a functional B6 de deficiency. And then you can't make de novo NAD and you're reliant on taking niacin supplements. But high dose niacin would actually cause moco steel. But probably you're not making molybdenum cofactor anyway. And so then you're actually not really good at metabolizing away any of those nutrients on the previous slide. So... Your pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, it requires thymine, lipoic acid, coenzyme A, FAD, and NAD. And so if you have none of these on board, even if you, in, if you relieve the overactivation of NMDA, it's, you're not going to resume normal metabolism. And so what if the chronic need for the carnivore diet that's very low in the ketogenic diet what if these are therapeutic for people's block at pyruvate dehydrogenase complex? But is it therapeutic for restoring your ability to, to make um, molybdenum cofactor? No, it wouldn't be. Because if you're on a carnivore or a ketogenic diet, you're going to be having to use your DTP to go through gluconeogenesis. So it's kind of tied up a bit, right? And that's a problem. So it could be, oh, and then also, so ketoacidosis will actually cause 
calcium channels to open up too, and the calcium will be high intracellularly as well in ketoacidosis. So ketoacidosis doesn't, pr pr uh, doesn't help you to restore your molybdenum cofactor production. So really what we're going for and what I think should be happening is most people are not who are stuck in this do not to tolerate large amounts of carbohydrate. So they need to eat very small, frequent meals to prevent their body from going into gluconeogenesis. So I've been experimenting for myself, and you need to talk with your own healthcare professional. I've been taking just eating 15 grams of carbohydrate and 15 to 20 grams of protein every two and a half hours so that at least during my waking periods, I am consistently feeding my body so that I don't have to go through gluconeogenesis. And Chris Masterjohn says that just having low blood sugar would increase the activity of CDO. Well, I think my CDO activity is off the chart because of all the hypoxia going on and all the s sulfocysteine all that damage, it's, it's crazy. So, um, so yeah, so consistent small meals and then, um, for, you know, I think part of it is going to be a block of NMDA, but you're going to need to do this under the supervision of a professional and you need to probably have specific labs done. Um, and I should have made a slide on that, <laughs> but, but, um, I actually have it in the thesis statement, like specific things that I think would be helpful. And I'll just list them out right here and I'll put it in the show notes. I mean, the YouTube notes. Um, I, I think that you should have your aldosterone levels checked because I think this pathway can cause hyper aldosterone, uh, how, wait, how do you say it? Hyper aldosteronism. <laughs> so it would end up making you lose both sodium and, um, would you go chloride? No, you'd be losing a lot of sodium. And then you would want them to do a, at least a basic metabolic panel. So you can look at your sodium, your chloride and your, um, CO2 levels. If your albumin is normal, please do not use albumin to calculate your anion gap. You don't require that for calculating anion gap unless your albumin is low. So use your chloride, your sodium level, and your CO2, also called bicarbonate, to calculate your anion gap and see if you're in hyperchloremic, non-anion gap acidosis. I'll link a calculator in the notes. And if you are, then you're probably chloride sensitive and just working on um, avoiding very high levels of chloride, like from sodium chloride, could help you manage your headaches. Um, but then you'll have to find an alternative way to get in sodium. And so I, in my thesis, I talk about possibly using sodium bicarbonate, but usually people can't, from a, a metabolic standpoint, they can't tolerate more than like a quarter of a teaspoon for an entire day mixed into two liters of water. So um, probably you're going to have to talk about this with a physician if you're severely electrolyte imbalanced. You're going to need specific IV fluids and monitoring in a hospital when you're having a crisis. Um, from, uh, I mean, you could get an organic acid test done, but if you don't have money, you can just go on Amazon and you can buy um, sulfite test strips for water and check, check your urine in the morning. And if there's sulfite, there shouldn't be, we're supposed to be making sulfate. So um, both me and Zoe have sulfite in our urine. Um, so do a lot of other people in our Facebook support group. Um, which was a bunch of my clients. And I made it because I was just running out of energy messaging everybody. <laughs> so, um, and we kind of worked this all out together. It was a good team effort, trying to share symptoms and stuff for a good month. Um, so those are, those are the big labs. I would, I mean, you can get a, a complete um, blood count, which would actually tell you if you have low white counts, because it would also tell you if you have low mean platelet volume. So Sulfite can destroy platelets, it can destroy white blood cells, it can destroy red blood cells. Um, it, it wreaks a huge havoc on lives. Okay, so I kind of listed a few things on here that I'm going to talk about in the future, but it's probably just ongoing. Um, probably I'll talk next time about the crossroads of the HIF-1 alpha pathway and transsulfuration and kind of like walk through what I think is happening because I think what eventually is happening is I don't think we do transsulfuration except for upregulation of CDO. So I think that's probably the reason why that we grow those um, SIBO bacteria to provide our body with hydrogen sulfide. Um, I actually think that we don't want to kill those guys off 
I think that it's our only way of downregulating the hypoxia-inducible factor one alpha path pathway in our gut because hydrogen sulfide actually will inhibit the gene transcription for HIF1 alpha. So we want to turn it off. If our cells aren't making their own hydrogen sulfide because of functional B6 deficiency, then we want our SIBO bacteria helping us out. Now we don't want too much hydrogen sulfide. So, you know, try not to overdo high sulfur vegetables um, is helpful from a symptom standpoint, but also, you know, too much H2S will become sulfite. So and then I'll also talk about the, a little bit more about electrolyte balance in another video. Um, I'll talk about how s can contribute to porphyria, specifically like the acute intermittent type. Um, and then how cysteine deficiency will really screw with your skin. You kind of look like a giraffe. I have white spots. You know, I thought it was a fungal infection, but after you take like all the available fungal um, medications and you still have white spots, something's wrong. <laughs> um, you can check out the thesis for more information on that if you're super curious. Um, and also I'll talk about all the things that go wrong with vitamin A metabolism as time goes on, because the reason why we can't, you know, in the vitamin A toxicity group, everyone complains about vitamin A makes me constipated and vitamin A gives me like, this is true. It can destroy your joints when you're not doing well with metabolism. Um, you can actually have loss of collagen, but it's not necessarily, it is the vitamin A, but the reason why you're not doing well with vitamin A is because of sulfide toxicity. Okay, that was a long, a long, long video, and I meant for it to be short. I'm just not good at being short-winded, as you can tell by my really long thesis, but I would have to say that smart, um, I don't know, I don't want to say I'm smart. It seems like conceited, but I'm a hard trier. I like to think, and I try really hard, and when you have like a glutamatergic type of thing, like I have like glutamate on steroids, I can't stop. I just keep thinking and thinking. And so I might as well put it down on paper and in a video. So thank you for listening and I love you all. And I hope that you will find healing and that God will bless you. Amen.